and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome, everyone, to the Reverend Faith and Current Affairs. I'm Jamie Franklin. Uh, my voice is shot today. I was talking too much for the weekend. It's better than it was. Which I think it's getting stronger the more we argue. The more we argue, yeah, because we just did an uncollared episode, which went really well. And uh, not not only have I not lost my voice, but my voice is strengthened, which I take as a, a sign from the Lord that um, that this, you know, that I am in the right. So there's there's a. <laughs> In all of in all of our disagreements, that's, that's a um, impetus to all those listening. Going, I wonder what they argued about. And I'll, you know, go and buy a um, subscription, <laughs> to, <laughs> and you'll find our uncolored argument there. Yeah, yeah. go to reverendpod.com and support us on Patreon for as little as one pound fifty plus VAT per month. Yeah. I usually do that plug later on because I want. I know, but sure they've got something. But yeah, but no, they might have tantalised them. You know, the idea of two reverends just arguing. Um, you know, may may have may have. Um... <laughs> I enjoy I enjoy our argument. I do too. I do too, Jamie. Yeah, because think, because you know. it's um it's it's fun, isn't it? It's coming from a place of friendship. Indeed. Normally, I don't like arguments, but ours ours are genuinely quite fun, and I'm sure people find them very funny as well. Good, I hope um, so. Yeah. Can we just start with a couple of notices, Tom? Um, yeah, on them. So the church church on the website. I won't go through what it is, but thanks to everyone who's sending their forms in. Um, to recommend their churches. If you've got a church that you'd like to recommend, which you think listeners of a Reverend would like, because we have a lot of listeners who are looking for churches, uh, go to our website, reverendpod.com, and fill in the form and say, you know, this is my church. This is why people might like it. And similarly, if you are looking for a church, it's lots of people say, oh, yeah, I want a church, blah, blah, blah. I don't know where to go to church. And they're seeking because they're spiritually hungry, Tom. Um, go to the website, go to reverendpod.com and click on Church Finder and go on the map. And then you can see, is there a church in my area which I could visit? We're not endorsing all the churches. We don't know what they're really like. Anyone can put a church up. And I don't know. I've not been to them all. Neither is Tom. They might be really heretical or I don't know. They might preach loads of sermons about climate change in Ukraine or whatever it might be. I don't know what it's going to be like. So just check. Just check on the website. Have a look before you, before you spend loads of time going there. Apparently, there are none in the West Midlands. So. Um, uh, if you're in the West Midlands, you especially like in Birmingham. Birmingham's Birmingham's in the West Midlands, isn't it? If you've got a church in Birmingham, if you're a listener from Birmingham and you go to church, that's you, the listener who's listening to this, and you're in Birmingham and you you go to church. If your church is good, recommend it on the church finder, please. Reverendpod.com. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing I just wanted to plug, which I got wrong last week, is I'm planning on arranging a Reverend meetup at the March for Life, which is happening in um, on Saturday, September the 2nd. I'm just going to double check that. So I got that wrong last week. Uh, and there was no excuse because I was doing the podcast by myself and I had loads of time to check. Yeah, set, set, uh, September the 2nd, which is a Saturday, going to arrange a meetup for the March for Life. Uh, which starts at the Emmanuel Centre in central London. So if you'd like to come along to the March for Life, please do. I don't think it costs a thing. I've never been before. I don't really know what it's like, but lots of people say it's really great. Um, yeah, just mark down your diary and there'll be more um, more details. Um, are you coming to that, Tom, if you decided? Uh, when is it? Sorry. Saturday, um, September. You, 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 I, I, I zoomed out, yeah. I was looking, I was reading an article. Um <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I, I, I tend to zone out in the notices. Sorry. No, um, right. yeah, go Saturday, again. Go again. Saturday, Saturday <laughs> September the second, March for Life, uh, Central London. Um, I'm, I'm I, think I, I think I might be doing a wedding. Okay. No, I'm definitely well, doing a wedding. Yeah, Tom, uh, but Tom I mean, won't it, Tom won't be there, but I will, and I'm also uh, going so, to in, invite Daniel as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, please go, and I'll, I'll be praying for you because it's such an important thing to witness. To um, we've spoken about it quite a few times, and um, I think it's. Um, you know, I think it's important to be stand up and be counted. Uh, and I wish I was there. Um, yeah. But but I will be celebrating the sacrament of uh, holy matrimony. Um, oh, that's very uh, Catholic. Of you. Uh, no, I'll be I'll be marrying a couple of people um, in uh, in Burwash. So, very which good. is a joyful it's a joyful thing to do. Do you get many marriages in your new church, Jamie? I haven't had any so far. Well, obviously, <laughs> you, do you have any this? You don't have any, you don't have any this season then. No, no. I, I think churches like they tend to sort of um, go through times when they're more used for occasional offices and times when they're not. 
and it, it strikes me that maybe this one isn't used very much for occasional offices. So, but we'll see. I mean, it's a nice church, beautiful church, right? Mm. In Manchester. But of course, there are, there are lots of nice churches here. Yeah, there's a cathedral, there's a hospital of St. Cross and so on. Um, one thing about this event, uh, Michael, who is the man with the beard, former Buddhist with a beard, who's been on the podcast, he sent me an email saying, um, meeting, the best place to meet is at the Emmanuel Centre from 10.30 um, there is mass at Westminster Cathedral. That's um, obviously a Roman Catholic cathedral. Uh, if people want to go to that, the Emmanuel Centre is a large nonconformist church in the heart of Westminster, and hosts various stalls and has presentations, etc. And there are loos there as well, and places to sit down. So anyway, so that that's going to be fun, and we'll think. Well, there'll be details closer to the time. It's still July. It's way too early to be um, planning all of this, but just you know, that's it. Anyway, so one thing to say at the beginning. Um, regardless of whether you support us or not on, you know, Patreon. Uh, if you like the show, please subscribe to it on YouTube, on your podcatcher. Share it around with your friends and family. That makes such a huge difference. That's a massive part of how podcasts grow is by people recommending them, saying, hey, you know, listen to this. This is great. And uh, rate and review us on iTunes. Now, I said this last week, right? I said, can please, can people please rate and review us on iTunes and other places? And have they done it, Tom? No. What do you think? Well, I don't actually know because I haven't checked. So I thought it'd be funny, not funny, but maybe interesting for me to check right now while we're talking. So should I do that? Oh, no. See if um, they've got any ratings. No. Oh, no. I may have got, we may have got ratings, but we haven't got any reviews since mm. May, in fact. So can we have some reviews on iTunes, please? The last the last review we had is from someone called Humpasaurus on the 10th of May. And it no, is a good review. It's a good review, to be fair. It says amazing podcast, first rate podcast, insightful discussions of current affairs and how faith can play a vital role in today's world. And it's not like we're some kind of small time podcast with no listeners. You know, we were number 10 in the Christian charts in the UK this week. We've been number one three times. You know, we haven't won any awards, but that's just because we're too that's because we're too edgy. Too edgy, Jim, which is too, too edgy. Cutting edge. But yeah. we we have it we have a big audience, so there's no reason why why people can't go on iTunes and just give us a review. And then maybe we'll read them out like I just did. And that would be fun. It would add something to the show. So please do that. Please, please help us. Make this yeah. podcast great again. <laughs> I mean it's always it's been sorry, great. It it's still it's is great. It's pretty great, isn't it? Um it's great. But you know, we 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 want to um, help people. You know, yeah, of course. basically, we want to. That's what the mission is. So we're really grateful to those who who help us um, out by funding us and um, you know all the costs. And also, um, yeah, you know, it has been. If you're thinking, you know, I really want to um, use my money in a way that grows the kingdom of God. You know that sort of stuff. Then. Um, then it has been, you know, successful people who have come to find faith in, in Christ through us. So, so it's a, you know, all the time. And that's it's a great, um, it's a great evangelistic um, sort of place. So we're really pleased with how successful it's been, and just want to grow it. Really, of course, of course, um, we reach more people. And there's there's loads of there's loads of people we could reach because when you break down the demographics, it's like, well, you know, there's a few like hundred people who listen to us in London or Birmingham or something like that. Uh, it's it's you know that we have a big overall audience, but like when you actually look at how many people listen to us in different places, it's not really. Do we have that, that many? So many more. Do we have that many in Birmingham? Do we? I don't know. I haven't looked at the it's demographics for ages. But the point the point I'm making is like in a city of mm. hundreds of thousands or even millions, there aren't loads of people who listen to us. So there must be many more. It's only logic. It's only logical, Tom. There stands to reason, people, Jamie. Stands to. There must to be reason. people who would love this podcast, but they just haven't. They haven't had the good fortune of encountering it yet. So please, I'm getting passionate now. All right, we should do some Bible. You're lose your voice, this, yeah. this is going to make um, it sound like we are some on some kind of ego trip here, but we're really yeah. not. You know, we just want to share with people the good news. Right. Um, right so we're doing, we're doing Jeremiah, aren't we? Yeah, should we, do, should we do a prayer? Let's do a prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You do a prayer. Okay. Which should we do the Lord's prayer? Yeah, That's yeah. What we normally do, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. All right, let's do it. Jeremiah, so good. 
So uh, did it, is it, I, c- I can't quite work out what you've written here, but we do first one and then four to nine. Is that what you want? That's that's what I think, because the other bits are the kind of historical details. Yeah, okay. I know you've got this thing about, oh, you can't miss verses out because otherwise, you know, you're editing it and you're just like the people who write the lectionary who just leave out bits which they don't like, which to be fair, right. they do. <laughs> this is it's, a, it's only a problem really, if it actually changes really the meaning relevant. i mean yeah. if it changes the meaning then you're in real trouble if it doesn't then it's probably all right it is um, it is shocking though isn't it i've, it got, is, I've, got, it, a Eucharist, really... I've got eucharist tomorrow and there's a reading from um exodus is it exodus 19 and it's yeah. all about the mountain and the smoke and the fire and everything and they just cut out the verse, the verse which says that if you touch the mountain you'll be stoned it's like that's part of the story. It's you know what well, you just cut it out because you don't like it. I mean, it's just... yeah, it's it's vile. The, the, the revised common lectionary is a vile piece of evil. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and, uh, and needs to go, Jamie. <laughs> I, I'm, I actually want to reintroduce. Um, I think I might take us back. We on should to go the back to the BCP. BCP yeah. le- the BCP lectionary just. Um, uh, the problem is that, that it just happens over and over again, and it happens. Um, do you know, um, it happens in the canticles as well for morning prayer. Occasionally, yeah. there's that one from Isaiah where it talks about the um, the grapevine, the grape press, and, and the wine running out, and it makes it sound quite eucharistic. But then when you read it in Isaiah, it's about the blood of the peoples pouring out of the wine. You know, um, it's quite gory. It's about a, a sort of conqueror. It's a similar yeah. sort of imagery to the. Uh, to the blood up to the fetlocks of the horses in revelation anyway um yeah. we um on that, on that cheerful on note, that cheerful note uh let's chapter 29 to, let's turn to scripture yes um so well rather than reading out verse one we we'll just say the context which is this yeah is, okay go on. so this is from jeremiah prophet um to those who nebuchadnezzar took into exile so all the people in exile i believe jeremiah was exiled into um egypt wasn't he so he's writing to those in yeah he's um, in jerusalem at this point though isn't he yeah, he's got back. Um, that's right. Um, so he's now writing to that's the, to why the I exiles in verse one because it would have said all that. Yeah, right. slightly, slightly, slightly more qu- quickly actually. But anyway, um, <laughs> this is what he wrote. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon: build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord goodness me it's, it's, a, it's a great piece so it's really interesting isn't it because we, we're in a position where where the people of israel have been punished for their iniquities uh, over many generations and the and the davidic kings in particular um they they allowed um canaanite worship practices to enter into the temple they um they interbred with the canaanite population they transgressed the law of god they did all sorts of awful things and in the end worship they worship yeah. the heavenly host the uh, yeah baals the baals and in the, the end um after a series of warnings that after not turning away um jeremiah being the most fe- sort of the most wonderfully gloomy i like jeremiah um he has all the really crappy jobs doesn't he, he doesn't he, 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 he has some to, bad jobs as well jeremiah has to, has to too. buy a new loincloth and then take it and soak it in the river and then leave it to rot and then put it on and go in front and prophesy wearing this sort of rotten loincloth <laughs> <laughs> i can <laughs> this imagine you is, this is what i will do to the people of israel doesn't yeah. jeremiah also burrow through the city walls yeah he, he might to, do to, to it's, it's, it's always bad news though isn't it with him it's it is like, yeah it's it quite gloomy one. Um, yeah. But this isn't bad news. This isn't bad news, because actually this is this is a this is hope. And I think um, so. It's quite radical that he's saying, not saying, uh, you know, of oh, doom and gloom, uh, you're in punishment, but rather go there and prosper and seek the prosperity of, of the city of Babylon. And I think we could probably read this um, uh, by analogy into our exiled condition. Um, uh, um, so we are kind of in exile in, in, in a Babylon, sort of in, in a world full of sin um, and in, under punishment for humans' iniquities. And Christ has released us from that, but we're not there yet. God, so in, in our exile, we are to 
um, seek uh, the peace and prosperity of the city to which we are. So, you know, I kind of, by analogy, maybe, maybe this is going too far, but by analogy, we are to, um, uh, to, to try and, you know, we're not called to turn away like Anabaptists and form communities and, and disappear from, um, no, mind you, it'd be lovely. And I, you know, um, I think we, the, 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 our local Anabaptists are fantastic. You met um, Ian, didn't you, Jamie? Anyway, um, the Robertsbridge, uh, Brudenhof. Anyway, uh, you have met him. Uh, the, um, the point is that we, we're not called to do that, but we're called to engage and to try and seek the prosperity of the, of the world that we're in. <clears throat> I, I mean, uh, you might be. I, it's just, it's just as a caveat, uh, is there a chance of misrepresenting those communities because they often do, they often do engage. No, they they do. Own. You're right. You're right. So yeah. I just 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 want to put that out there. They're, they're, it might, it, it, I know what you're saying. I do know what you're saying. So it, it's an interesting point, isn't it? And actually relevant to our first story, which I'm not saying we should talk about right now, but it's interesting the thing about seek the welfare of the city, um, because I think we can we can on this show we're often saying things like, well. You know what we need to be doing is preaching the gospel and discipling people and well, that is that is seeking the welfare of the city, isn't it? Because that will, you know, if if the gospel was was heard and people followed it, then the world would become a better place, wouldn't it? it yeah, would... of course, it, of course, it would. But I think there is a sort of cultural remit here as well, isn't there? To yeah. to improve improve the environment uh, that that you live in, um, not just in a kind of spiritual sense, but in a in a material sense as well that can be an act of love and service i think the problem is is that what we have in the modern day church is this kind of what i refer to as imminentism where the only thing that ever seems to matter is the sort of material conditions that we live we live with and the spiritual aspect of things is never discussed um as though it's a kind of secondary thing it's it's, it's sort of upside down i think it's the spiritual is primary um, and our job, especially as priests, but you know all, all Christians, um, are, you know, are sent as as evangelists and apostles into the world to to share the gospel and to uh, to to share Christ with people and hopefully to see people one one for Christ. But there is a cultural remit as well, isn't there? To um, as I say, to try and improve things for people so that people might benefit from them. Yeah, I think. I think I, so. I think. Oh, also, sorry, you carry on. You carry on. Sorry. I mean, it's. I think it's about. Um, I'm, just, I'm just quite interested uh, in this idea in, in Babylon as well, because obviously God, in the end, brings forth um, brings forth the, the the return from Israel uh, to, to, of Israel from captivity through Cyrus, um, who becomes king of Babylon, and so in so you know his his power and wealth and security enables him just to let them go. Um, and yeah. he worked. God worked in a very mysterious way there because it's the first time, as far as I'm aware. Maybe it happened a bit in in Elijah and the sort of the the the, the, the Davidic kings. Um, that sort of God's salvation plan was was sort of executed through someone who wasn't a Jew. Yeah, well, it's it's very strange, isn't it? Because it's like he almost hears from God, doesn't he? And he sort of sends them back. I can't quite remember exactly what happens. Yeah, there's there's something like that at the beginning of um, um, Nehemiah as well, isn't it? Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah. I think this. Well, that's like, the post-exilic um, rebuilding, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, so that, not, it's yeah. not Cyrus at that point, is it? It's someone else, I think. Yeah, I can't quite remember. But no, you're you're right. It's like the Lord working through the um, the pagan emperor. Um, and you, I suppose you could also say that the Lord works through, um, you know, sending marauding armies into Jerusalem from Babylon and you know, King Nebuchadnezzar and things like that as well. But the, the thing about Babylon, I, I thought with this, is it's quite relevant to us as Christians in the post-Christendom world because it is as though we are, we've moved from, I'm not saying that Christendom was perfect, but there were many, many more Christians around and and the Christian gospel had leavened society to a much greater degree than than is currently the case and so what we have now is a situation in which um we are we're living in the kind of in the age when christian faith is receding and a kind of post-christian paganism is taking hold and so we are in a sense in a new exile i think where we are a sort of minority voice and increasingly a completely unacceptable one so i think there is something i don't know do you think there's something in that yeah 
Yeah, it's a question of what the prosperity of the city means to us now, doesn't it? That's the yeah. that's the thing that needs to be discerned. Yeah, the welfare of the city. Mm. Yes, indeed, indeed. Well, should we move on to our first story because it does it does lead in quite nicely? Um, and I just I just uh, highlighted this. I don't know. I don't know whether whether people are going to think I've got some kind of obsession with this um, this ULES thing. So, for people who don't know, the ULES is this kind of ultra low emission zone charge. Which um, I don't live in London, but it's been it's been implemented in London and um, in central London. And, and Sadiq Khan is wanting to, or he is expanding it to to outer London as well, greater London, where it's much more kind of like suburban, lots of places and. You know, people rely on their cars for you know taking their kids to school and stuff like that. And it's basically a twelve pound fifty charge for people with diesel cars or cars over a certain age. I don't know, is it like ten years old or something like that? Yeah, it's a certain age limit, isn't it? So anything older. It, it, of course, um, the any science behind it has shown that it makes absolutely no difference. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is that. Um, the but uh, Rowan Williams uh, is very keen on it. Um, he led faith leaders <laughs> to support the expansion of ULES. Um, do you know ULES is silly it reminds me of um, do you know The War of the Worlds um, uh, by Jeff Wayne yeah yeah, yeah. the musical you know, the dun, musical dun, yeah dun, that's one but the sound the sound that the, um, the, the, the the sound that the aliens make is Yula! anyway <laughs> <laughs> like this great big ululation kind of distorted yeah. riffing through the uh, through the music and then there's that kind of guitar riff da, 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 da. Yeah, anyway it's um, great, it's it's great. Great. I saw it in O2 um, actually it's really good wow um, yeah, yeah, um, and uh, when I was a lad, and it just reminds me of that. So it's, yeah. Yeah, anyway, um, Hulez, good link, uh, alien howl of distrust and fear. Anyway, so shall, um, I quote, shall I quote from Williams just to bring oh, us? Back if you must, if so you Paul, must. Yeah. Paul March, Bishop of Canterbury, who, uh, yeah, it's it is a bit disappointing. This kind of thing in a joint op-ed written for the I newspaper, the three religious figures. Who's the other two? Uh, Zara um, Mohammed, um, Secretary General of the Muslim Council of, Council of Britain, and Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg of New North London Synagogue. Thank you, um, yeah. including Dr. Williams, who was Archbishop, uh, blah, 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 wrote, uh, by phasing out polluting vehicles and embracing measures like London's ULES, we are actively working towards protecting the health of our communities and living in alignment with key teachings of our faith. And I was thinking, you know, Tom, uh, what do I find frustrating about this? Not that um, they're making political pronouncements, but they are. It just seems like these political pronouncements are always they're always um, they're always um, left liberal progressive pronouncements that take no uh, account of the inconvenience and difficulty that this might cause to people who can't afford to comply with these measures. And also not taking into account uh, any kind of critical angle on this, which would say that you know essentially this is a this is an undemocratic tax, uh, which is which is raised in inverted commas, but it, you could say stolen four hundred million pounds from people who have used um, their cars in London, uh, and who you know most of whom would never have known that this was going to happen to them when they bought their cars in the first place. So, you know, when it talks about living in alignment with the key teachings of our faith, you could say, well, one of the key teachings of our faith is thou shalt not steal. And these, well, the, you know, Zedi Khan is basically just stealing money off of people. You know? I mean, it's, it's not quite certain which key teaching of Christianity, um, poor air quality uh, um, sort of uh, contravenes. I'm, yeah. I'm not, not entirely certain that it does. I mean, I guess you could argue that, that, that it might... Um, I don't know really. Um, well, do unto others I, I, as you I, do unto yourself. This is the golden asked, rule. Um, I asked someone about this this week because they emailed me. And and by the way, I don't mind at all if people email critical emails and they you know they got arguments or questions. That's absolutely fine. I, I honestly I don't mind that. So please please don't worry if you want to email a criticism team to to um to irreverentpod at gmail dot com. But I was saying you know th this they were making a similar point, and I was saying you know. Um, Jesus never said anything directly, literally never said anything directly about care for the environment. And I and I I challenged him to name one verse or one teaching of Jesus that could be directly applied to the environment. I mean, can you honestly can you think of anything Jesus said 
that said anything about the environment. Like, is is there anything? Did he say anything about preserving the natural world, the natural habitat, or about trees, or about? I mean, it obviously wouldn't say anything about pollution, but it might have said things about pollution because the Romans might have burnt stuff and polluted stuff. He just didn't care. He wasn't interested. And it's 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 just funny when they talk about key teachings of the faith. Like what what is which where is the scripture that talks about this? It's, I mean, it does it, not the, exist. The best you can I mean, I've I've seen people try and build up a sort of scripture of climate change through use, misusing Romans eight. Uh, yeah, but that we've talked but, about but, that again. Yeah, but it's that's not, just, it's not that's yeah. just silly. Uh, uh, it's just a silly misreading of, of what Paul's saying. Um, so, the, so, so then they fall back upon Adam's um, sort of priestly ministry over creation. Yeah, the cultural mandate. Um, yeah, but it's, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't have much of an emphasis in the New Testament. I, if anything, God likes burning stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talked about the way the apostle, <laughs> apostle Peter says that the world is going to be incinerated and it's going to melt as it burns. Well, it's, it's more. Like, I mean, you know, you know, fifty heifers and a. You know, yeah. a hundred sheep and yeah. a couple I mean, of doves. I mean, you know, no, listen, I'm not. I'm not saying that we should, you know, pollute the earth and treat it really badly and everything like that. But to pretend it's sort of something that flows naturally out of the Christian scriptures is, well, this, a, this is a joke. I think. I mean, it, Can I just give an example, Tom? Just go on, sorry, just go on. so I heard a very a person, by the way, who I respect a lot, who said this. I'm not going to say who it is, but someone I really respect who's really helped me personally. So I don't mean this as a as a as a, as a, as a personal insult. But Matthew chapter 25 used in order to justify this. So, you know, the final judgment, when the Son of Man comes in glory, uh, before him the nations will gather, he will separate out the people one from another, and then the sheep on the right, goats on the left. Um, and then it will say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick. And he was applying this to climate change and saying that this is a kind of outworking of doing uh, these things but it's not but it's, it's not but it's, about the environment it's talking it's, about caring for people for it's you. not even it's not even talking directly about caring for people it's talking about caring for brothers and sisters which matthew is only used to describe the christian community really so so it really is quite specific um uh the brothers and sisters language in fact it's just brothers in the in the in the greek of course um is is a, is for matthew about um uh about treating other christian communities or other Christians, basically, um, it's, okay. it's it's not a general command. I mean, it could well be. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's bad to, um, to you know clothe the poor and feed the feed the hungry and look after the sick and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, um, the, the that's not what this particular parable. Yeah, but you saying. I don't think you dispute that, that is the that is the implication of su- certain of Christ's ethical teachings. Yeah, but it's it's not it's not whatever it is. It's not directly about caring for the environment it's not no. directly about caring for the natural world and i suppose what you could say at the bigger at the, at the greatest stretch you could say well the natural world is being destroyed by climate change and we can stop that by having less carbon emissions and that would be good because it will save everyone from dying in you know some kind of climate apocalypse um but you have to believe all that stuff you have to believe all the empirical claims that are being made and the empirical claims that are being made are, um, well, enormously um, speculative, and I just think they're basically false. I think the whole narrative is completely false. So maybe it's maybe it's a um, maybe it's an maybe it's a, an empirical question. I, I don't I don't know. Um, but the idea that like t- t- taxing people twelve pounds fifty to use a diesel car is going to make any difference to anything is a fantasy. I mean, even if it's all true. It's still a fancy. It's not going to make any difference. You know, it's, 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 you know, we're talking about, um, we're talking about something which is complete irrelevance, relatively speaking. You know, if you consider how much carbon dioxide is being pumped into the atmosphere by nations like China and, you know, who aren't interested in any of this stuff, it's just, you know, tax, it's just, it's just, and, you know, there's no, there's no concern for the people who are being, inconvenienced by this so people who that we again i won't name who it is but you know we know a priest who's in central london and and some of the people there literally have just mothballed their cars because they can't use them anymore because they and they can't sell them so they just mothballed them they're just in their garages not being used because they can't 
sell them and they can't afford to use them. Now, is this, well, it's, is this right yeah. to stop people from using their vehicles, to tax people, to take their money, uh, take money away from the people who can you know, least afford it, which is what's actually happening here. It's something that it doesn't really impact the middle and wealthier classes as much as the, the lower and, and poorer classes as much. Is this right? Why do, why do these people never ask? Why does Ron Williams never ask this question? Why, when Justin Welby is talking about immigration, does he never acknowledge the problem that it causes for uh, working class communities in 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 the country why is this why is it always the same thing why is the other side not acknowledged yeah well I, and and sort of just just rationally i'm kind of um in the in the model of sort of matt ridley the sort of optimist um is, is, is this a sensible way to sort this problem out it's not, you know, I get really annoyed by General Synod who are constantly putting more millstones around people's uh, necks. They're, they're like the Pharisees. They're literally like the Pharisees who, who are like, you know, um, who, who go beyond the word of God and put, put, put um, un unfulfillable kind of um, injunctions upon, upon the backs of people. Uh, but they've yeah. done it with the, the environment over and over again. And, you know, as a, a, you, you, they've, they've committed us all to do the... Um, Net zero by 30, uh, 2030, which is complete nonsense. Um, they've, um, uh, I mean, I mean, you may as well, if, you, if you're going to argue that, you may as well shut down all the churches. Uh, they've even, you know. they've even, they've even accepted that it's impossible, and they're saying that they're going to have to offset the carbon emissions that will inevitably still be. So, pay, even, I mean, you may as well just close. Close down the churches. I mean, they probably, you know, that's sort well, of this out, is this, is, this um, is the problem. <laughs> this is the problem, isn't it, John? And like Daniel has talked about this quite a lot. It's like, you know, where is this actually leading? Because is it? To, is it's, it doesn't seem to me to be too much of a stretch that at some point General Synod will say, well, maybe we should consider having church services once a month in order to reduce our carbon footprint. Maybe that's mm -hmm. the only way. And then lots of people will say, yeah, because this is an outworking of our our of the key teachings of our faith. You know, this yeah. this may be coming down the line. I, I mean, would it surprise you? No, no, it wouldn't. I could see it happening. Um, it's a bit like that awful document from, do you remember we reviewed that way back that was sent that um, COVID thing from um, Exeter, which sort of with ministers saying, oh, you know, it's quite good not to have to go to church. I, you know, it's quite a relief. <laughs> and people, you know, it's being published. Anyway, um, the, the point is that the point of the church is not to become carbon neutral, it's to spread the word of God, even if that means burning carbon. Um, <laughs> sorry. It's, to um, worship, it's to worship God. Yeah, you know, worshiping yeah. God is, is like um, our highest priority as human beings. Yeah. So, uh, and um, so all, all other things being equal, you know, it's not a high priority. Um, and and you, you already had a rant about this last week, didn't you, about the, the putting this, uh, the, the general sort of motion to put this new thing in the um, oh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the confirmation. confirmation service, which is, and this is, again, literally like... Safeguard the integrity of creation. It's, it's not, it's not part mean? of the core Christian belief. It shouldn't be in the confirmation service. You what can be a Christian. Safeguard you can the be... integrity of creation. Can you tell me? I don't mean, know. It's kind of... What does it mean to say safeguard? safeguard? What, what does it mean? I mean, I tried to. <laughs> they had to get the word safeguarding in there, didn't they? I tried to like pass it to sort of try and work out um, safeguard. So, so to keep to keep safe to prevent from harm, but the integrity makes no sense. I mean, te what would the integrity of creation even be like? The, well, it's like when it's all held together. So the, the weak. Yeah, we're going to say the weak atomic force. Like, make sure <laughs> the, weak, the weak atomic force doesn't suddenly stop happening. I don't think that was in our power. It might be in God's power. To, like, to unbind the atoms of creative creation. It's like basically. implying that it's all kind of expanding and it's yeah. all going to break apart. And it's up yeah. to us in our Christian yeah. discipleship to, 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 to hug, hold, it, hug, hug it all together. together. By and never using carbon. If only we if only we just stop using carbon, then then this will not happen. The weak the, atomic you know, force would never <laughs> go. It's the weak atomic force. There's weak and a strong. No, the strong force is electromagnetism, isn't it? The weak force is what holds atoms together. I'm glad you um, understand this, Tom, because there'll be lots of confirmation candidates. I, th I think it's confused. Um, anyway, so um, so basically, we're going to have to try somehow through not uh, not using carbon to hold off entropy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And that's and that's what it means to be a Christian. Into that's what it means to be a Christian. Um, anyway, uh, it's nonsense. Do you think there's people like what? What? What kind of concerns people have? You know, people who disagree with us. I'm just trying to think. Like, what? What? Could, they? They? They must. They must think that. They must think that this is a legitimate outworking of the Christian faith. I mean, we're talking here about like 
you know, talking about con- collective responsibility to re- help reduce pollution and everything like that. And I think part of the problem is it's like there are things which are true here, um, but they're mixed up with a narrative which is but, just it's just a it's just a complete um it's just a completely saw- crazy sort of quasi-religious view of the world. Like I would agree that if a place is really nastily, nastily polluted and not very nice and all the water's impure and all that kind of stuff, it'd be good to not have that stuff. Obviously, I'd agree to that. But I don't agree to this narrative that the world is about to end because of human induced climate change and that we can stop it by using carbon by reducing our carbon emissions. I just don't believe that's true. I believe every I this, aspect of that is 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 basically false. It's challengeable, especially, yeah. Especially the thing about reducing carbon, as though it's like a kind of um, you know, it's like it's like a kind of knob that you can just sort of cart turn down and it will reduce the temperature of the earth like it's a thermostat. It's just it, it just is complete nonsense. And it does and as I was saying, we can't do it anyway because we can't we can't, it's not going to make any difference what we do. It's literally going to make no difference. We're putting ourselves through this. Through, we're putting, I say we're putting ourselves through it. There's been no, um, there's been not, no though, parliamentary debate. There's been no parliamentary vote on net zero. Nobody's voted for it. No no person has voted for it. It hasn't been democratically decided upon. When did it sort of w- wangle its way in? It was sort of Theresa May's thing, wasn't it? Yeah, sort I, of can't, of I can't remember, actually. I the think tweet- but it's the same um, with the Church of England. Like, who's actually consented to this? Which which um, parishioners have actually been asked whether they want their money to be used in the pursuit of this agenda? I mean, has anyone actually been has anyone actually been asked? I know that's not the way the Church of England works, and then we've got general synods and everything like that. But surely it's um, surely it's an important thing. It's just like they just decided that we all agree to this apocalyptic view of of what of what's going on and and of what we should be doing. And so I don't agree. And there are lots of scientists who don't agree as well. You know, we've we've done um we've we've talked before about many of them. You know, I mentioned Steve Coonan last week in his book Unsettled, people like Bjorn Lomberg, um, you know, many of whom like they've got different views about what's going on. Um, but you know, we had that that um that document which had um there's uh, signatures from I think it was tens of thousands of scientists which said that there is no climate emergency. But it's like well, I think I think don't exist. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 a, it's the big switch and bait, isn't it? Or bait and switch that the media do, which is go from there might be human-induced anthropomorphic climate change, which is, you know, um, may or may not be true. I'm not about to argue that. But but from that, it does not necessarily immediately follow that it's a disaster, mm. you know. It, and, and that and that actually, that second thing, that it's a disaster that, 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 um, that needs uh, everything thrown at it is not one that is unanimously held among, among scientists. It's not. Yeah. It's and just, this, uh, this thing uh, as well, we're at it. I mean, the way that the weather is reported yeah. now. Oh, it's like, yeah. It's like the apocalypse is, is happening in, in, where is it supposed to be happening at the moment? Greece or whatever. But it's so, it's so, um, it's, it's just so unscientific the way that this is being, even to somebody like me. And I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this or anything like that, but I, even I understand the difference between climate and the weather, you know, like the climate is something that uh, is, is something you, you um, work out what it is over time. It's like the way things are sort of on, on average and how they change, not whether or not you have a hot day every once in a while and how, how stuffy everyone feels you know, like last last year, we had those two days where everyone went absolutely crazy. And they're like, oh, my goodness, we're all dying from climate change because it's so hot. We can barely even go outside because it's so hot. These two days, oh, my goodness, everybody's going to die because it's so hot and it must be climate change. But you know what? This summer, it's actually been quite drizzly and it's cold. You know, I'm looking, I'm literally looking out my window now and it's cold and wet outside and the sky is grey. And it's the middle of July. It's about the same time in the year um, that those two those was, two yeah. days happen. It doesn't mean anything. It's just the it's just the weather on this particular day. It's meaningless. It's not the climate. And surely climate scientists know this, and yet they go, they they allow this this fear-mongering propaganda to be pumped out left, right, and center. Apparently, these um wildfires, it is in roads, isn't it? In in yeah. Greece. Apparently they're started by arsonists anyway. So it's it's like the, the, the level of deception is unbelievable. And then they'll go, oh well, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, it started by uh, arsonists. But it's the hot weather that's enabled it to, to go. Well, actually, <laughs> the conditions you know, are um, ripe for the arsonists. It wouldn't be dry. But actually, I mean, it's always change. 
It's always dry in, in Greece at this time of year, but um, and it's usually quite hot. I don't know. I'm not quite sure why they think that four degrees is going to make that much difference to the dryness. But um, the the other thing is that it's actually about land management, and um, they're not clearing forests like they used to, uh, because you know for ecological reasons, going to be paid not to use the the ground in that way, and so there's more stuff to burn there's tinder everywhere like literally tom i'm looking at my window there are people walking around in coats in winter coats with yeah it's not being, it's not and, being warm, and their it? umbrellas up it's just it's just whenever there's a hot day people go oh you see climate change but when it's like this nobody says anything nobody says oh i i think climate change isn't a problem now because it's so cold it's just you know it's just people don't realize this people aren't stupid surely well <laughs> We should probably, I mean, what happened, the other thing that happened, of course, was that um, Labour didn't do well as well as they thought they were going to do in this Uxbridge by-election. Well, they lost, didn't they? Well, the, yeah. the, the, Tories have, the Tories have got an MP, which is... Um, yeah, and, and this is widely being blamed on the ULES charge. But, of course, Sadiq Khan says he's going to press ahead with it anyway because um, it's, you know, it's what he wants to do. And he doesn't care what people think because he's not interested in the the opinions of the people uh, whose lives his political pronouncements affect. What he's interested in is saving the world from climate change by taxing people for using diesel cars. Um, so thanks, Sadiq, for that. Um, we should move on, Tom, to the CFE's Ethical Investment Fund. This was an article that was sent to me or sent to us. Um, it's from UK Column, and it's about the way it's about what uh, the Church of England does with with its money, essentially what it what it invests in. And um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things about this. I mean, l- we'll put it on the show notes as always, but it is really quite sort of strange mm. and weird, isn't it? So you've got this situation where the church has how much does it have? I'm just looking. It's got like um, ten point uh, one billion, uh, ten point one billion pounds to invest in things. Uh, not all of it's invested, obviously, lots of it goes on other things, but uh, essentially it has this kind of um, ethical investment policy. But the ethical investment policy is really strange because it it says that they won't invest in certain things, but only if those things don't derive more than a certain percentage of revenue from whatever it is. So, for example, um, and I just want to find out what this, what does this thing NIB stand for? Basically, the NIB is the is is you know their their investment fund so the nibs do not invest in any company involved in indiscriminate weaponry so this is talking about the church of england's money moreover they do not invest in companies involved in conventional weapons if their strategic military supplies exceed 10 percent of the turnover oh, it's fine if only 10 percent of your company is making you know things to shoot people with it's fine to invest in jamie yeah it's fine yeah, i mean yeah, what, are you, what are you talking about right go on yeah, exactly. The NIBs do not invest in any company that derives more than 3% of revenues from the production or distribution of pornography. Well, so that's fu- it's saying, fine. <laughs> it's saying that basically they can invest in in um, in uh, revenues. One pound and 30. Three, yeah. that, that make up to 3% of their money from pornography. One pound and 30, yeah. A major part of whose business activity or focus is tobacco, gambling, non-military firearms. I mean, what are those? Police firearms, uh, organized crime firearms, m- mafia firearms, high interest rate lending, or human embryonic cloning. A new policy on alcohol is in the process of implementation, under which companies deriving more than 5% of their revenues from alcoholic drinks are only eligible, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the new climate change policy does not allow investments in companies that derive more than 10% of revenue from tar sands, thermal, but up to 10%. So it's it's very strange that the Church of England is investing, or at least would be open to investing in companies that would make money from pornography firearms tobacco uh, alcohol as long uh, as there's only 10 percent of each you could do it <laughs> tar sands uh, thermal coal apparently there's an individual policy document which which um which explains uh, the theological theolo- theology ethics and reasoning underlying the the policy so it's very strange um that they would do that they would do this but then the, the really um kind of concerning thing is the 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 list of companies that they're actually investing in and uh, i just want to read something of this um so of the top 20 equity holdings most recently listed by the church commission so this is the top 20 um organizations that the church of england invests in financially a full six of them are directly or indirectly enabling the research of human fetal stem cells 
and then it it, um, it goes through these. Um, so, like for example, um, Baxter International um, uses aborted fetuses to conducts to conduct its um, its business. Uh, Beckton Dickinson and Company uh, manufactures tools for the enumeration and analysis of stem cells, and is a leader in the expanding field of organoids. Organoids are laboratory grown organs, which include brains and they're originally stem cells. Um, there have been suggestions that artificially created brain tissue may be sentient. The BD motto is helping all people live healthy lives. All lives, this is the editorial, that is, except those that have been purposely begun, begun and ended by the company. And we should just say, like stem cells. Um, so, I mean, I may, I'm trying to get the ter- terminology right here, but I think I'm right in saying that human embryonic stem cells are essentially um, fertilized embryos, yeah. which are, I think they are, um, they're either made artificially in a lab or sometimes they might be, are they taken from aborted fetuses and things like that? I, I mean, I think you, I think you can harvest it from abort- aborted fetuses where, um, from the spine and places like that, can't you? But often taken very young, very, very young. Yeah. Um, but, but in any case, we are talking about fertilized. Yeah, we're talking animals. about humans. We're talking about individual human sets of DNAs that, if allowed to go naturally, would become a yeah. human child and then a human adult. Yeah, um, the, the, yeah, and that would be um, that would be the mainstream Christian position on on what's going on. You know, the yeah. beginning of life. That there's the, the conception um, is is the beginning of life. So you're talking about things that you're talking about things that human life that has become. Uh, and which is being used in scientific experiments and then discarded. Um, there are various other uh, companies that talks about uh, Illumina Inc. For example, this is another company uh, that they, uh, the Church of England invests in. Uh, quote: It has a document on their website which says uh, that embryonic stem cells can only be derived from human embryos that were created using in vitro fertilization for reproductive purposes and were no longer needed for this purpose. Um, and then um they say they'll continue to evaluate and update this but essentially they're using stem cells from human embryos uh, and then they're discarding them if they don't need them uh salesforce is credited by the world economic forum as a key driver of the fourth industrial revolution not only salesforce concerned with the harvesting of embryonic stem cells it's also pushing for a transhumanist world in which artificial intelligence controls all via the internet of things uh samsung um has a stem cell and regenerative medicine institute uh doesn't even qualify the position ethically and it just goes on and it and the article is kind of asking why um is the church of england investing in these things um why does it have a threshold uh up to which it can invest in things like pornography and things like that um why is it why is it investing in firms that specialize in uh human embryo embryonic stem cell uh research in this way it's it's very strange i don't and i don't know anything about it all i've done is i've read the article but i don't know what did you make of it tom well i mean there's a big question i mean yeah i i don't so the whole point i'm 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 sort of don't really like the way the church has done this over the years anyway um so the church commissioners have a big pot of money that they stole off parish churches that's basically how it goes. Uh, they 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 took the glebe land. They took the um, historic holdings of the Church of England, and by and large, they sold them on, and uh, and then used the cash to invest. And I guess on one hand, um, you know, this is going to be inevitable, isn't it? Because if you're just buying sort of um, shares and looking to to grow the money, then you're going to end up buying shares, and not quite knowing everything that goes on. on the other hand. Um, it just seems that they could, if they wanted to, do a little bit of basic research and be a little, quite a bit more strict about these these things. But um, I why guess do every- to, why do they have to invest at all, though, Tom? I mean, is this really what well, the should be? Well, doing so I'm saying. Money? Well, I mean, the, the the point is, it's it's weirdly not really the church's money, is it? It's it's owned by the church, but very little of it actually. Yeah. I guess it's its way back to it. It's just confiscated off the church, and then gradually the things it supported have been reduced. So um, here we have the return made ten percent on their ten billion uh, last year. So it's a billion pounds, um, uh, which is and of which they basically kept hold of most of it. Um, 86, 86 million went to the 
the diocese and the local church 42 million to bishops and archbishops yeah and that's that's Um, shocking isn't it because they're planning on spending 100 million on educating people about the historic injustices of slavery and the perpetuation of system systemic racism in in the contemporary world so they're going to more on that than they spent last year on supporting diocese and the local church I think to be fair, um, I think that hundred million is that they're, they're investing the income from that hundred million. But anyway, you're right; it's, it's, it could be. Um, it, it, that's it with the point. Cathedrals uh, cost twelve point three million. That's sorry. Is, yeah, sorry, you were going to say twelve point. It's just you know, million. it's just twelve million between cathedrals, other activities, whatever other activities the church commissions are doing, six million. So you know, they're, they're, there's quite a lot um, of money for just unspecified activities, isn't it? What what are yeah. those activities? Six million is a lot. Kind of, yeah, who knows? Um, admin. Uh, admin. It's always admin, isn't it? So it's yeah. and uh, a lot on pensions. Total charitable expenditure, excluding clergy pensions, is one hundred forty-seven point three million, and total cash paid on clergy pensions is one hundred sixteen point one million. I understand that those are just historic pensions; they're not current pensions, which are actually funded in a pension pot. Um, I think I may be wrong. Um, but all in all, you know, actually, that sounds like there's a lot of hundreds of millions going on, but actually it's a relatively small amount of um, the, um, yeah, the total. So, so 0.9 nine, point, point nine of a billion was still back back into the investment fund last year. What's the point of all this growing of money? Yeah. What is, What's the, point? What is the point of it? Um, so Ian Paul makes an interesting point that, that really we need to increase stipendary uh, ministry um, uh salaries because they haven't gone up since significantly since 2004 or something they've they've in real terms they're 20 percent short smaller than they were 20 years ago really? which is quite a lot yeah no yeah, which is quite a that lot really, not, yeah. isn't it, really um and but we don't um, need the money tom we should we no. should we should give our money away so that um the well they could they can, could can invest in more um tobacco um they could they could zero companies. they could zero the debts in, in more Paris more churches, macro, in like, pornography. sorry karen they could they could zero the debts in parish churches for 100 million or something, which would be, you know, seems to be worthwhile. Um, they could take all the churches of the church and they could reduce their need on the parish share. They could, they could just, um, they could just stop the need for parish share. They, they could easily do that, but they don't. They make us all labour um, and fund um, the ministry that way, whilst having sitting on a growing pot of money they originally confiscated off the parishes. They're making pay it, so it's a bit irritating, really. And they're doing um, it, and they're doing it through investing in unethical in, in, immoral things well, yeah. I, I guess i guess partly it's going to be really hard to, to to find a completely ethical company isn't it like all companies are going to be sinning in one way or another so if you, if hey, you, if this, you is, this is this is six out of the top 20 that yeah no I, I know what you mean but like um, the other ones even the ones that we not mentioned the alphabet that's the google holder isn't it i mean they're you know actively discriminating against christians in many ways amazon.com um we have you know people have general issues with them don't they um for tax avoidance and um uh yeah but it's know, slightly different it's, isn't it? it's slightly different meta too. meta platforms that's facebook so the church of england have a big holding in facebook um yeah who who are actively um sort of you know hostile towards christianity um it's just as... it's, it's it's a bit different though don't you think you know with uh, uh, the, uh i suppose another way of saying this would be like why isn't there ethical investment policy that they won't invest in firms that profit from pornography and and manufacture yeah. firearms I, know, I, I agree and but, using yeah. human stem cell embryos in scientific research why can't they just have a policy that's just zero percent of those things i can understand like if, you know if um by implication those firms uh, might indirectly profit then there might be a question there, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about firms that are actually doing these things, like carrying them out as part of their their main yeah. um, revenue. Yeah, I, I, I sort of agree. And it looks like when he asked the question, they t- they refused to answer them. Oh, because, yeah, what did they say? Yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, really I asked the Church of England it. official about wider engagement in the investment process and whether or not any of the details were promulgated at diocese level. The line received from the diocese was that my questions were quite leading and therefore would not be answered. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, just uh, I did actually I I did just do a little research to see what the Roman Catholic position on stem cell research was. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, it was quite interesting, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's basically I mean to summarise it, it's that uh, unless there's a well, this is a quote actually, unless there's a moral certainty of not causing harm to the life or integrity of the unborn child and the mother, um, and unless there's free consent given, uh, then it shouldn't be carried out. Um, so any research that's carried out. 
um, is illicit if it involves risk to an embryo's physical yep. integrity, unless it's therapeutic. No, by which, it, by which they, by which presumably, if you're doing something that's experimental but might might increase the chance of that embryo living, then there's a moral case for it. Yeah, but that yeah, that, yeah. that embryo, not a general embryo, not not, yeah, sort not of research for down the line. But if that if this is an experimental procedure that's done on an embryo in order to try and save that embryo, that's 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 licit. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the key line here, probably. If the embryos are living, whether viable or not, they must be respected just like a, any other human person. Experimentation on embryos, which is not directly therapeutic for that embryo, as you're saying, Tom, is licit. So um, that's the very, very clear um, Roman Catholic teaching on it. And it's another it's another area where you just wish there was some moral clarity in the Church of England and why we why we're so compromised with the with the spirit of our age and yeah. with the world. Anyway, we should move on, Tom, um, because we're running out of time. Um, so I just wanted to I, this debanking thing. I, I wasn't particularly interested in it when it was like, oh, you know, N Nigel Farage has been debanked, and you know, I mean, obviously he's being debanked for his political views. But now, Tom, not even reverence in the Church of England is safe from being debanked. Now, if people don't know what debanking is. It's when a bank account, uh, bank uh, sorry, closes your account because they don't like you because of your political views, which has happened to the uh, the old irascible Nigel Farage. But now it's happened to a reverend, Tom. The Reverend Richard, not one of us, I hasten to add, the Reverend Richard Fothergill, I've not heard of before, but he sounds like a good man. He actually answered a, I think it was a survey uh, from his bank. So this is this is even worse, really. A survey from his bank uh, asking some questions about, you know, customer experience. And he, he politely questioned their promotion of transgender ideology, at which point he received some kind of reply uh, from them, um, which just appeared all of a sudden, it said, your comments will not stand. We must start protect our workforce from prejudice. Um, the, and then it said the relationship between us has irrevocably broken down. And they essentially um, closed his bank account. And and um, and all he was doing was saying that the transgender ideology was uh, a bit sinister and that um, the banks shouldn't be promoting it, which yeah. it seems to be a reasonable thing. Because, you know, surely banks are about um, banking banking, and, you know, just taking care of your money and stuff. But uh, apparently, uh, apparently not. Uh, they, they did say we want to hear from you in this letter as well, in this email. So, well, they didn't, did they? Only... We better be careful. <laughs> we better be careful to what we say to our banks. You banked, yeah. Um, the next I, get, I do get annoyed by, um, by companies. Uh, you get it through the whole of June, don't you? Just like a, a company that's completely unrelated to any sort of ideology you know they're trying to sell I, know, I think i've got one people trying to sell bike computers to me that i'm on the mailing list because i thought i might once have a chance of winning something right. and uh but like winning a new you know flashy bike computer and yeah. they're sending me sort of uh adverts about you know lgbt stuff and you're thinking I, you sell bike computers yeah exactly you, there's no need for you to have a position on this like How is it relevant um, it's not relevant to your business it's not relevant you know if they sold, I don't know, something directly relevant, then I wouldn't be buying from them anyway. But um yeah. okay. <laughs> you know, it's just it's 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 yeah, really and this irritating. this reverend this reverend, he didn't even say, you know, I'm against this or anything like that. He just asked them whether promoting Pride Month was such a great use of their time as a bank and what the implications were yeah. for their brand. Yeah. But I mean it's just it's it's just funny, isn't it? Well, it's not really funny, it's it's um it's it's very pernicious and we can't you know if we lose our bank accounts what we get i was thinking about this what would happen if i lost my bank account is i back with nat west who are the bank that debanked well i guess one of the banks that well they've i mean i don't think they can be doing that again because um no, the, 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 the chief executive has resigned. resigned yeah yeah so oh yeah well hopefully we're hopefully it's the best bank, probably the best bank to be with then isn't it but mm -hmm. um if i lose my um bank account then um, what would I do? What do they do with the money? Do they just send it to you in gold? Or... I presume they send it to you in, in notes. Or, I think really? Notes. Okay, cool. I mean, that's not cool. I don't want, I don't want my money. We have to go and collect it. Um, <laughs> my money just showing up in a van with an angry note. Yeah. Our, our, the relationship between us is irrevocably broken down. Here's your money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, well, you never know.
Yeah. Well, anyway, that's just something to be um, to be aware of, isn't it? I have actually tried to obtain this guy's um, contact details because it'd be quite good to have him on the show. He sounds he sounds like um, a natural ally. Not uh, sorry, I should use maybe he's maybe he's already Na- a listener. A natural you friend. Never know. You never know, Richard. We haven't had any. We haven't had any um, interviewees for a while, have we? It'd be nice to. Well, maybe we'll, get, maybe we'll get yeah. Richard on. Yeah, it does mm. just shake things up a bit. Um, yeah. Well, we need, we need some more allies. I, mean, I keep using that word. I mean, friends. Allies. I don't, allies. I don't really know allies. It's, been, it's another one of those words which has been corrupted, isn't it? It used to be a good word, like in the Second World War, like the allies. They were the good guys. But now it's like this horrible word that makes you shiver. You know, are, so you, got, an ally? are you an ally, Tom? We've got quite yeah. a few emails. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm an ally of the poor. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I know you're trying to move us on. But can yeah. I just do a quick uh, oh, plug for support? Um, listen, to, to viewers and, and listeners thank you so much for for getting this far in the podcast presume that you like it if you're here so i hope you don't mind me saying that um if you like this podcast and you want to see it continue and you want to see us reach more people and continue to reach, reach people as we are doing uh then please consider becoming a supporter today yes um you can support us on patreon for as little as one pound fifty plus vat in the uk per month and um, you do that by going to reverendpod.com and clicking on the big red button. And if you go on Patreon, then you get our free audio podcast for everyone. Even if you're on the lowest tier, it's called Uncollared, and where we basically chat about stuff, we argue, we have jokes. The one today, I think, is pretty hilarious, if I'm honest. So um, you uh, you want to go on that and do that. Now, why do we need this money? It's because I rely on it for my income, because I don't have an income from the church. and part-time. I just do this and some other bits and pieces and make money that way. So you're putting food on my table. And of course, we have overheads and stuff like that. I bung a little bit of cash, Tom and, and Daniel's way every once in a while for their expert services. So every little helps. And um, it's great to have such support. Um, buy, you know, buy Jamie a throat sweet. That could be our campaign for today. Yeah, you could, buy, I, buy, buy, buy me some throat sweets. You could do that. You could send them to my church. Uh, don't really do that. So it's, I can buy my own throat sweets. Uh, and um, so, so yeah, please do do that. And um, um, if you, if you uh, can't, I'll t- I'll tell you what I'll do, Jamie. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get my local herbalist who comes to my Thursday group to send you one of her. Oh yeah, one of her uh, concoctions. Yeah, well, that um, be. Lovely. She listens. She listens. So okay, well, yeah, please, please do. Um, just to finish my plug for support, um, uh, you can also buy us a coffee. Uh, which is for people who don't want to support us, you know, on a monthly basis. That's fine. You can buy us a coffee and just leave us a nice message. We have quite a few recently. Uh, Nigel, thank you uh, for the podcast. Sad Ferret bought us 20 coffees. It's really nice. So you basically, you, 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 you don't donate money and buy us a coffee, but really, um, really, um, you're just giving us money, really. So another person says, here's a coffee, Jamie. Is your one went cold? I think that's referring to my episode last week. Sorry, it's just the one, but we have found ourselves unemployed. Sorry to hear that. The Eleven Podcast galvanizes our spirits and sets us up for the week. This week's show was un- was exceptionally good. It must have been challenging without Tom and Daniel to bounce ideas. You said that it was a disaster, Tom, in our in our funny uncolored podcast. Did you? Said you said it, not did me. I? I'm not listening to what I'm Why saying. Why did I say it was a disaster? You said it was a disaster because you and Daniel went on. You said it must have been a disaster, but this person yeah. saying it's exceptional. I didn't say it was a disaster. I said it must have been a disaster. Anyway, yeah. you anyway. Could, just be, could just be kind, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Michael Ward, yeah, exactly. They might be humouring me. Michael Ward, <laughs> thank you. Really appreciate what you're doing. Can't, this is the person who said he lives in the godless West Midlands and he can't find a church. Andrew says, far from boring. Yeah, so another person says, a reverend in the Delling pod are highlights of my week. Um, and there are there are many more. Um, and then there's another person who says, thank you for your excellent podcast. Would be fascinated to hear more on the music in the Matrix. I think that must be a sarcastic comment because I, I went into quite a lot of detail about that when I spoke to Nick Dixon. So anyway, if you can support us, go on our website, reverendpod.com. Rage Against the Machine. Um, <clears throat> become a Patreon today. Click the big red button. If you can't become a That's, patron, go on a re- go on the buy me a coffee, which is yellow, red, yellow. Click on one of those and support us, please. Uh, it, it really, really helps us. Sorry, Tom, you were dying. Are, to make some kind of hilarious comment. No, I mean, not really. Um, it's just, it's just saying that Rage Against the Machine are quite woke these days, aren't they? They've, they've oh yeah, them. yeah. I mean, I always knew that they had a left wing agenda. You know, kind of. I don't know what they are, sort of communists, sort of angry, angry kind of um, South American communists. But I love, I loved the music. You know, I love Tom Morello's guitar playing. I think he's a fantastic guitar playing, but good guitar player. But to be fair, I've, I've pretty much grown out of it now. I don't, I don't really listen to Rage very much anymore. 
even like in terms of heavy stuff i might still listen to i just find it a bit like it's a bit blah isn't it it's a bit like uh, you know a bit 90s first album was quite good still but yeah um yeah. we should do we should do a uh we've got an email of the week here we're going to do this one yeah, um, yeah. Uh, for some reason that you know that um i've spliced this email of the week with the um with the not on purpose with the the document from the roman catholic church donum vitae so I, I, either, <laughs> I did, either i did that or you did it i don't think i did it's quite easy if you click sort of when you highlight something and then you move you and drag it around i would no, I just, <laughs> just did it again i'm just completely mad that all right listen um do you want to um <laughs> read these emails out because yeah okay let's do one of them okay let's do, we'll the, do, the, do the top one. do the top, do the top one. okay hi jamie tom and daniel thanks for another great podcast this week just thought i'd share a few thoughts sorry no doubt you have many to get through i've been going back to church partly due to you guys partly due to dante the thing that struck me first and most surprisingly about the catholic mass and our attend is how different everyone is from each other the congregation is large indian african filipino east european west european chinese south american north american mediterranean i'm in a university city but nonetheless it's quite remarkable how many different ethnicities attend also young and old male and female the frail and the strong chaotic families trying to control their babies young couples holding hands some people on their own a well-heeled woman with her little dog someone straight from the gym, someone who's clearly struggling with mental health issues, an old gentleman with his missile, a level of diversity that any HR manager would give their right arm for, but not engineered, rather a result of free association inspired by a common purpose. So as I stand there wondering what it is that I have in common with these people, I realise we're all there for Christ. There we all are, all together. The priests preach the gospel and say the mass. That's what they do. No other agenda. We listen, pray and receive the sacrament. This is what we do. Everything is how it should be. So when, as Tom mentioned, the cardinal-elect, Agua of our church says the church is not in the business of conversion. What am I supposed to think? This is all somehow a fantasy, just one possible choice. My own conversion has been a slow process and I still rely on evangelizing voices to ground me in the faith. This week, following the gospel of the parable of the sower, the officiating priest started his homily with, let there be no doubt we should evangelize all of us each in our own way. There was a murmur. He continued, some have said we should not try to convert others. Well, I don't know where they get that from. Certainly not Matthew's gospel. God bless that man mm. defending the gospel. Um, yeah, well, quite. I, I don't think it's endemic in Catholicism. I just think there's a problem there, you know, just to come uh, away. Yeah, we, not, we, can't really, uh, we can't really uh, talk uh, about. Yeah, um, <laughs> as, um, so there's there's obviously, um, this is a Portuguese cardinal I spoke about a fortnight ago who um, he claimed that they're not there to convert. Um, anyway, um, and this is what you guys are doing, defending the gospel. Thank God for you and for that priest. Always, I find when someone takes a stand to defend the gospel, these works of Christ come to mind. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, and that's <laughs> where you spliced in, yeah. John and Vitae from the doctrine of the faith. It's going to say it's the doctrine of the faith. Uh, that is quite wordy for Christ. Um, Perhaps it's uh, not directly therapeutic. <laughs> <laughs> Those you famous words from Matthew's gospel. <laughs> Um, uh, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Something to cleave to, and the dark forces seem too great. Thanks, and thanks again. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> do you know what? It's, it is notable that that Christ was very direct, wasn't he? All these sort of wordy church documents, no matter how right they are, um, you know, one wonders whether that we should just um, be a little bit more blunt. Let's just get back to the words you know, of Christ, shall we? Why, just, don't we just just, get back, why don't we just get back to the words of Christ? What's yeah. wrong with that? Why do we have to have all this, you know, this jargon all the time? No, I agree, Tom. Anyway, Tom, we should probably do this now. Here we go. Tom, well, it's time once again for Question the Rev. That great time when somebody asks a question... And then we, the Revs, answer it. So now, let's do Question the Rev. See, I have to talk throughout the whole time in order to, to do the whole jingle. Um, okay, so... Should I read it? Because keep your voice yeah, safe. Yeah, uh, you, you read it, yeah. Good morning. morning. I hope you're well. Good morning. Uh, it's afternoon. It's um, afternoon here. Uh, I hope you are well. I am. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your podcast, <laughs> and I'm really enjoying the Uncollared Bonus one too. Yeah, that's why, that's why um, people should become patrons. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good little yeah, extra. I have a question. I think best falls under the question of the rev section. Here we are. Um, 
I've noticed that my faith comes in waves. I'm relatively new to faith coming to Christ within the last five years, but I find myself going through a period of deep conviction where I consume a lot of Christian content, reading the Bible, podcasts, YouTube, etc. This can last a few months, but this seems to be invariably followed by a period where God feels distant, so I struggle to do the simplest things, such as prayer before bed. I have heard this happens to other people, but how does one deal with this? During the peak of faith, I'm all in, but during the trough, 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 <laughs> trough. even the... Even the simplest aspects of the faith feels like pushing a boulder up a hill. Um, I worry that one time the tide will recede and not come back. Any thoughts would be greatly appreciated. God bless. Rob. Thank you, Rob. Um, it's, yeah, a good thank question. You. it's a good question. Uh, are you going to church, Rob? I think that's probably the best place to start with sort of dealing with the with sort of highs and lows, peaks and trials, troughs, trousy troughs. What is um, a trough? I, don't, I don't even know. Is um, a real thing? Trough. Um, a trough's a <laughs> double trough. word, trow. I don't think trow. No, 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 trow's not really. No, trow is like an archaic word for think or believe. No, 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 no. This is Unto thee I do like polite my trough. Trow. Yeah. Oh, it's also a malignant or mischievous fairy. Okay. Well, there we are. Okay, kind of yeah. works. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the everything in life we're not really very good at being consistent as humans are we like we everything goes in waves um and uh, of enthusiasm and very few things if we can sustain um I, I think it's quite natural to have this sense of spiritual highs and spiritual lows uh, and times where it feels easy and times where it feels hard i think the key is to keep as you are doing it when it feels hard um it's very easy to be spiritual when it's all you know all, all fine and good and you've got a real connection with god but when you kind of keep on trying that's when you know that you've got something real uh, and something that you're actually valuing um it's if you discard it um that there's a problem uh but i don't think that the tide will recede and not come back at least i don't at least i pray that it won't um i think that uh that you're um the fact that you're thinking about this is, is key um mm. to, to to that not happening um what would my advice be? Um, to take yourself as you are to God. There's a wonderful moment in Screwtape's letters um, from C.S. Lewis where um, he, he encourages um, his um, uh, the demon to, to sort of try and encourage a sort of God feeling when, pe when the, when the, when the um, human goes to church and make them feel that they ought to have that feeling. If they don't have that feeling that somehow church isn't working or it's not right for them. Um, whereas in reality... Um, we take who we are to God, and uh, and that's all that God asks. He doesn't say, you know, I want you to feel anything other than to put Christ as Lord of your life. Um, you know, so sort of seeking to to engineer um, peaks is probably um, futile. I don't know. What do you think, Jamie? Yeah, no, I agree with that. In fact, I was going to mention the screw tape letters as well. Um, but I think I think the issue there is, and I can't quite remember the exact passage, but I think the issue there is is about trying to manufacture it, isn't it? Is that um Christ does make a difference to the way that we feel and you know, bring and uh, one of the things I've been thinking quite a lot about recently is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, some of it's about the way you act, but some of it's about the way you feel as well, as like having joy and having peace and things like that. So there's nothing wrong with wanting those things and, and seeing those things as a natural fruit of the Christian life. But it's about trying to manufacture it, which is counterproductive. So it's one of C.S. Lewis's great insights that whenever you try and feel joy, you inevitably squash any joy that you might be feeling because you're no longer focused on the object that would cause you joy. So I think that's a really important thing. But the, the, I was going to mention, I think it's in chapter nine. I actually wrote a substack about this a while ago, which I which I looked up of um, screw tape letters. I mean, the thing about going, you know, through highs and lows is everyone has that. You know, some is Lewis talks about that. You know, the law of undulation because we're in time, because we're creatures and we're biological. You know, mixture of um, spirit and animal. You know, we we will feel different at different times for various different reasons, and that's totally normal. Um, but there's also a sort of spiritual law as, as well, which is that um, God sometimes allows us to go through those those times of peaks and troughs, and I, I really experienced that as well. Uh, but the reason the reason He does that is because He's not in the business of kind of overwhelming us with um, with feelings, but leaving it up to us. You know, he has this Lewis has this wonderful line. He 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 can um, he cannot ravish. He can only woo. You know, Satan. What Satan wants to do, 
um, in the screw tape letters and in real life is he wants to override our wills by kind of enslaving us to sin. Uh, but God acts in a much more subtle way than that. He wants us to actually um, intentionally turn ourselves to him. And so I think that that's, um, that's a really important observation. So when you go through those dry periods, it's actually an opportunity to really intentionally seek the Lord, even though you might not be feeling like it. And not to, like Tom says, not to evaluate it on the basis of how you feel, but to evaluate it on the basis of, well, you know, I'm being faithful. Uh, and that's and that's the thing that's important at this moment. I really liked, um, I've heard uh, Bishop Barron talking about this. I think the um, quotation comes from Fulton Sheen originally, but sometimes, you know, when you come into God's presence, and you're tired or you're not focused or you maybe feel sick or something, you know, like I have a bit this week. You just say to God, well, that I'm here. I don't really feel like this and I'm not really up for it, but I'm like a, I'm like a loyal dog in the presence of my master. You know, I'm just here and that's all I, you know, that's, that's as good as I can do at the moment, but I'm just like a, I'm like a dog, you know, lying in the presence of my master, like a faithful dog. And I think that's quite, that's quite a good image. So, yeah, I just, I just think you just need to keep going and find things which feed your soul, particularly through those dry periods. I find um, reading a spiritual book, keeping a spiritual book on the go, really helpful i'm reading a book by aw tozer at the moment have you ever read aw tozer Tom? no you'd probably like him because he's very protestant protestant evangelical which is what you are very against the anglican church <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so to, to have a spiritual book on the go and pray regularly throughout the day find a way of praying regularly throughout the day that works for you that feeds your soul i think that's an important thing but yeah, so it's a great it's great though to hear when you know people have come to faith recently, and um, it's yeah. just a wonderful thing to hear, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, good. Right, well, we should say prayer and finish, Tom. It should. Your your voice is held up, which is good. It's, um, the, Lord's, it's the Lord's providence. He wants this. He wants this show to 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 succeed, Tom. That's 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 the only way I can interpret the fact that my voice hasn't completely gone. Mm. What do you think? I think so. I think so. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this show. Thanks for all our listeners. Pray that your blessings lie upon them. Um, we pray for all those who we've touched upon um, directly or indirectly. We particularly pray for um, the Reverend uh, Richard Fothergill and um, his campaign to uh, against um, his bank. Um, pray that we might all be able to speak out for truth without being persecuted but that when we do get persecuted you'll give us the courage and the words to um to proclaim your gospel and um, we pray for rob for his faith that he may have your holy spirit dwell within him that he might be able to make that choice again and again and again and be sure in the knowledge of his salvation we ask this in the name of your son our lord and savior jesus christ amen Amen. All right, Tom. Thank you. As always, thank you to our listeners and viewers. And um, do uh, rate and review us on iTunes. Don't forget, do it now. Give us a good review so we can read it out next week and share yep. us and support us and do all those things. But above all, know the peace of Christ. That's much more important than any of those other things. Okay, so bye now. Goodbye.